if worship is remembrance and response, then the cross is a holy ground, isn't it? A place that we are brought back to to remember the extent of God's love for his people, for his children. Sometime near the year of 33 A.D., Jesus of Nazareth was arrested. He was tried, falsely accused, and crucified. And this took place under the authority of Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea, under the authority of Tiberius, uh, the emperor of the Roman Empire at the time. The crucifixion of Jesus is really an undisputed historical fact. That is, it's recorded not only in the biblical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it's recorded also in the Jewish Talmud. It's recorded in the annals of Tacitus, a Roman historian. But believing in the historicity of the crucifixion of Jesus uh, is not the same as being a Christian. It's not the same as being a child of God and belonging to him. It's not yet a spiritual commitment. Christian faith is more than knowledge. These are the things that took place. It's more than assent. I agree these are historically true. Christian faith involves trust. Trust. I rely upon what he did and who he is for my eternal soul for what I will face after death. It is faith and trust in the person of Jesus of Nazareth and in the meaning and significance of his crucifixion and his resurrection. Tonight we reflect on the significance of his crucifixion, the meaning of it, and if I were to just use a few words, I would use his words from John 19, which were read earlier. It is finished. It is finished. Three words in, in English, and as many of you know, in the original Greek language, just one word. Tetelestai. Tetelestai. It is finished. The British... Uh, preacher Charles Spurgeon said that to define that word, we would need all the other words that were ever spoken <laughs> or ever can be spoken to explain, he says, the significance of tetelestai coming off the lips of Jesus, as it were. The word itself was a common Word. It was used by accountants. It was used by merchants to, to mean or say the price is all paid. Uh, shepherds and, and priests would use the word when they found a perfect spotless lamb ready for sacrifice. To telestai. Servants, when their work was completed, would use this word when they would report to their masters. To telestai, the work is finished. It's, it's accomplished. It's, it's all done. Made an end of. Paid in full. It had all these meanings in the common usage of their culture. But coming off the lips of Jesus while on the cross, it, it meant much more. It had much more profound significance. Uh, coming off the lips of Jesus at that moment, to telestai was a victorious word. This was not, this was not the despairing cry of, of a helpless victim. It wasn't the last gasp of a worn out life. No, it was, uh, it was a very self-conscious declaration on a part of the man, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, the, the God-man, that all the work that he was sent into the world to do, he had completed. He had fulfilled all righteousness, as the Scriptures said. He had 
accomplished the work his father sent him into the world to do on behalf of those whom he loves. It was finished. It's a victorious word. And he was very conscious of this. In verse 28 in John 19, above the moment when Jesus said, uh, it is finished, it says there, knowing that his work was finished. Knowing that it was done, he said, I thirst. Knowing that it was done, he said, to Telestai, it is finished. And he said this, beloved, he said this after the betrayal of Judas. He said this after his turmoil and sufferings in Gethsemane. He said this after his arrest. He said this after he was spat upon and beat by the, by the Jewish uh, leaders and rulers and scourged by the Romans, which would have left his back and his thighs torn open uh, and bleeding profusely. He said this after he fell down under the weight of the cross because of the amount of blood loss. He said this after they had driven a crown of thorns on his head. He said this after they drove nails through his wrists and his feet and put him up on a cross and stripped him of his clothing and gambled for his garment right in front of him. After all this, after all this, he said to Telestai. And he said this also after a mysterious period of darkness, three hours of darkness that covered the land. It was reminiscent of the darkness that came upon Egypt on the first Passover, when the first Passover lambs were being killed, when the angel of God came and took the firstborn of those that were not covered by the blood of a substitute, the Passover lamb. And this was a darkness that was felt throughout the region and felt and written about in other sources besides the Gospels. And so after all of this and more, that's when Christ said to Telestai. It's finished. It's finished. And then he gave up his spirit. And John uses a very specific verb there, Referring to handing over his spirit. You remember that Jesus said he is the good shepherd and he has the authority to lay down his life. No one takes it from him, but he lays it down on his own volition. And so he gives up his spirit to tell us die. It's finished. It's finished. What was finished? Well, I've told you the the things that he did, the things that he accomplished, but what was the significance of all those things, of the sufferings of Christ? What was the meaning or what is derived, what is accomplished by the work that Jesus did when he fulfilled all righteousness through his perfect life and through his sufferings? What he completed was the work of redemption, if we were to choose one word. The work of redemption. Another word for redemption is atonement. That is, when he said he, it is finished, he means that all that is necessary to reconcile sinful human beings to a holy God, all that is necessary for anyone to be considered acceptable by the holy and perfect and just God, all of that is done. It's finished. It's completed. There's nothing left to do. The work of redemption is done. Scripture says that a great exchange was taking place in the life and sufferings, the crucifixion of Christ. Scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of of God. Scripture says, He bore our sins in His body on the cross. Scripture says, by His wounds we are healed, or those who have faith in Him are healed. Scripture says, Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, or on behalf of the unjust, that He might bring us to God. That's redemption, you see. The work of atonement. Uh, the work of a substitute on our behalf. All of that is done, it's finished, it's complete. And there in particular on the cross, 
Uh, the Father laid on him the iniquity of us all, as Scripture says, the prophet Isaiah. There he, the good shepherd, laid down his life for the sheep. There he purchased for God a people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, Scripture says. There, Scripture says, believers were reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to be presented holy and blameless and beyond reproach. There, Scripture says, he gave his life a ransom for many and even here, I would just pause and say, hallelujah. What a Savior. It is finished. You see, the Bible teaches salvation by the grace of God, salvation by the finished work of the Son of God on our behalf. And that salvation comes, that redemption comes through what is called penal substitution. Penal because it's the payment of a penalty that we deserve as those who have rebelled against our Creator God and substitution because He did this in our place, on our behalf. The just on behalf of the, the unjust. Um, he takes the blows that we deserve and by them He satisfies the Father's justice and wrath that really should be directed towards human beings, towards you and me. You know, for years as a, as a young man, I rode my, uh, my bike without a helmet. Well, not so young. I was married already. <laughs> <laughs> but younger than 62, 63. <laughs> and, you know, I read of a man who also never wore a helmet until his wife convinced him. And I said, okay, well, I'll start thinking about it. And the story goes that it was a week later that this man, this individual in the article, fell at high speed on his head. And the helmet shattered. The helmet, which he had recently been convinced to wear, <laughs> the helmet took the blow that he would have taken. You know. Cycling helmets are designed for that very purpose, exactly for that purpose, the, for the, exactly for that moment. To do what? To spread the impact over the whole helmet and to absorb the energy, to absorb the energy of the impact. Uh, and so helmets uh, save lives because they take the force of impact so that our skulls won't have to. <laughs> I know that's an imperfect illustration, but I think you see in there what it means that Christ was our substitute, that he took the impact that we deserve. The wrath of the Father fell upon him, all of it an expression of God's infinite love, all of it a work of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're never to think of the Trinity as somehow not in agreement about what's happening, you know. The Son somehow appeasing an angry father or so forth. For in this is love, not that we first love him, but that he loved us. And, and he, the Father, gave his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. As the late R.C. Sproul loved to say, we are saved from God by God, <laughs> save from God, by God, through the mercy of the plan of salvation. And to say that the work of redemption was finished is to say, again, there's nothing more to do, looking at it from the human perspective, nothing more to add, nothing, no religious duties left for you, no religious rites, no ceremonies, no moral deeds, no good deeds. Nothing left to add. It's true that for Christ there was more beyond the crucifixion. He spent three days in the grave and then he rose from the dead. The resurrection is the affirmation from the Father that the Son's work was complete and was accepted. The wages of sin is death, says Scripture, but death can no longer hold Christ because he paid the penalty of the law for which the cause is death. But for you and me, there's nothing 
more to add. And so in those closing moments on the cross, the Lord knew that the work he came to do was about to be completed. The life that you and I cannot live, he had lived, and the payment you and I could not endure, he paid and took upon himself. To tell us die. To tell us die is finished. That should make an end to all human religion apart from salvation by grace through faith in Christ. No work left undone. No further sacrifice to offer. Nothing left to do. No penance to experience in order to be forgiven or reconciled to God. The finality of his atoning work is affirmed all over the scriptures, all over the New Testament. The author of the book of Hebrews says, when Christ had offered for all time, listen to this, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. That is to say, he ascended to the presence of the Father because that work is finished, waiting from that time until his enemies shall be made a footstool for his feet. For by, listen again, for by a single offering, he has already, he has perfected for all time, forever, those who are being sanctified. Through one sacrifice, perfected forever, Who is perfected forever? He says there, those who are being sanctified. An interesting phrase, isn't it? Who is perfected? We know how we can be perfected through his one offering. But who is perfected? Those who are being sanctified. What is it to be sanctified in the sense here? He's talking here about a a, a new position. To be sanctified is to be set apart. It's to be consecrated Uh, in the scriptures. To be sanctified means that God has set you or something apart for himself, for his own usage, uh, and so forth. From the divine perspective, the basis of our being set apart and belonging to God is what I just read. It's the once for all sacrifice of his son. That's the ground on which a holy God could take someone like me and and bring them to himself and I not be destroyed (laughs) because I am sanctified. I'm set apart on the basis of my payment being made and the righteousness I need to be with a righteous God is granted to me or credited to me through my faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the once for all perfect finished sacrifice. So from the divine perspective, God does the sanctifying work. I quoted earlier from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. He might bring us to God. That's what it means to be sanctified. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says of the church there, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified, set apart in Christ Jesus. That is, you are sanctified by being in Christ, covered by Christ, united to him in a spiritual and mystical, unseen sort of way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says to them, he asks them to remember their former life. He says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, and such were some of you. (laughs) And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You are set apart, you see. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So from the divine perspective, who is perfected for all time? Those who are sanctified. Who are sanctified? Those whom the Father, on the basis of the Son's sacrifice, have been set apart by the Holy Spirit, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And from the human perspective, it's those who have placed their faith in Christ alone. From the human side of it, 
on Acts 26 and verse 18, the Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to Paul the apostle and reminds him that he sent him to open the eyes of the Gentiles. Paul's here saying, this is what Jesus said to me, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Sanctified by faith in me. That's how someone in a human level experientially can understand and know that he or she is in Christ. You have placed your faith in him entirely and now you are sanctified by being united to him. Everything that belongs to him is now credited to you. The perfect sacrifice and his perfect righteous life credited to you by your faith that united you to him. Nothing to add. Nothing to add. We heard from Romans 3, 26. God is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's it. And what's to be justified? Well, think about the judgment of a judge in a courtroom. The judge doesn't make someone just or righteous. What the judge says is, I declare this individual to be considered by the law in regards to the charges against him and her to be justified, not guilty. That's it. And you and I can be justified, declared acceptable to God and treated by God in relation to his law and standards to be perfect by virtue, not because he makes us perfect. That's in the end, end of all things, but because he declares us justified, sanctified in the Lord Jesus Christ. To tell us, die. It's finished. Everything you need to know that God is at peace with you and you're at peace with God was completed by his son. For you it is to receive it by faith. To know about it, you heard. To ascend to the fact that it's true. And lastly, to trust in him. To trust God. Take him at his word. To believe that what he says is true and to believe in his son. Nothing to add to it. Nothing that you should go and do. Nothing more that you should feel about yourself. It's finished. Turn to him. I have, I have a few things that, uh, that are works of art in, in my home, my study here, my, my study at home, a couple of paintings, some done by church members. I have some drawings. Uh, I have a drawing uh, by a, uh, a friend of mine's mother who was an artist. I have little sketches given to me by 10-year-olds from church, usually sketches of me. <laughs> I, have, I have all of these things. And if I were to take one of them, let's say, given to me by one of you, a member, or even one of my grandchildren, I were to take it and say, that is beautiful, thank you, but you know, I think it needs a little more blue right here. I just like to, you know, perfect, perfect, you know, personally I like green, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And what, 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 do you, what am I saying? What am I saying in that? I'm saying that's not good enough for me. It's not good enough for me. And so I wanna add to it. To tell us die. When Jesus said it is finished, he means it's all done. All of it. It's yours to believe. And to seek to add to it is to take away from it. It's to demonstrate you do not have confidence that this is sufficient for your salvation. To seek to add to the finished work of Christ. And people, I've been with people so many years 
and some of you and my own self, I know, we, we sometimes very subtly want to add to it in different ways. Some of us add to it through our self-loathing. We're not worthy of this. We, 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 we keep reflecting on some dark moment in our lives in the past. What would Jesus be saying to you when he said to Telestai? He'd be saying, I was crucified for you. I absorbed the wrath of God for you. Is that not enough? Do you need to, do you need to beat yourself up for a few more hours? Are you going to add to what I did in those three hours of darkness? Others seek to add not through self-loathing but through self-assertion, you know. This, this, this need to contribute. I don't take anything for free, you know. How can salvation be free, you know? They are performance-driven. And again, Jesus would say to you, I walked every mile. I fulfilled all righteousness. Will you add to that? Will you really? To add is to take away. <laughs> to tell us die. It's Good Friday. This is when we remember that it's finished. It's done. Our reconciliation, our redemption, our sanctification, our justification, the grounds for everything we need for eternity, the promise, the hope of the resurrection unto eternal life, the grounds of all that is done. It is finished. So what do you see when, when you hear about the cross in your mind? What do you think about when you hear about the cross? Do you see what the Roman soldiers saw? Some religious idiot, a fool, someone to you know, rob their clothes of, profit from? What do you see? Do you see what the chief priest saw, a false messiah? Do you see only what your parents tell you to see? What do you see, you see? Whom do you see? Do you see the Lamb of God slain for you? Do you see the Son of God who became the object of the Father's wrath for you because he loves you? Do you see someone who placed himself in your place, in your shoes, and took the blows that you deserved? Do you see the Savior? Who do you see? And if you see him for who he is, the Son of God, the Son of Man, who came not to be served but to serve and give his life a ransom for you, then you just believe in him tonight and be done with it. There's nothing to add. You don't need to go home and loathe over yourself for another week. You don't need to think that you need to try a little harder. What you need to do is turn to him in faith and place yourselves in his hands. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. And if tonight, I know the majority of you are, if you are here and you do see him as your Savior, as your Lord, as your substitute, as the one who took the blows meant for you, as the Lamb of God, your Passover who was slain. If you see him that way, remember that worship is rooted in remembrance and response. Remember the cross. Remember the cross, the price that was paid for you, and respond in praise and adoration by singing and by serving God with your life. Let's do that now. I'll pray and we will take a moment of silence and then we will sing once again to our Lord. I want to give you all a moment or two here of silent reflection about what you have heard regarding the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus and who it is you see. Talk to God.
Lord, when we lose hope, bring us to the cross and bring us to the empty tomb. When we fear, Lord, bring us to the cross and the empty tomb. When we have doubts, Lord, whether you love us and care for us, bring us back to the cross and the empty tomb. And I pray that you'd bring some tonight, Lord, for the first time in faith to the cross of Christ and the empty tomb. For Christ's sake, amen.